Hey everyone, welcome back to Adhere to Apologetics. Super pumped to join us today. Today I have Dr. John C. Peckham. He's a professor of theology and Christian philosophy at the Seventh Day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. Uh, we're going to be talking about what is God like and looking at the God of Scripture and looking at debates related to like timelessness and can God like experience emotions and stuff, all kinds of fun stuff. So John, thank you so much for joining me. Great to be with you, Zach. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super pumped uh, talking about this book here right there. And I was holding it upside down. So we're just going to like pretend that never happened. <laughs> uh, should have planned that out. And so we're going to talking about uh, just like what is God like? So do you want to introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about like who you are and what you do? Yeah, well, as you said already, my name is John Peckham. So I am a professor of theology and Christian philosophy at Andrews University. That's in Berrien Springs, Michigan. And my main areas of expertise are uh main area is doctrine of God. And I also do some work in theological method. And so this particular book, Divine Attributes, kind of deals with both more on the doctrine of God side, but theological method is, is kind of crucial to what's going on in this book as well. Yeah, it's super cool. So when we're looking at this book and we're looking at like the question of like trying to understand God, especially related to like some of these like big debates on like what is God is like, um, how do you view like the foundation of our thinking with regards to this? Yeah, for me, the foundation of theology should be scripture. I firmly believe that scripture is uh, the infallible word of God and therefore uh, should not only be formally affirmed as the infallible uh, rule, but also allowed to function in the way we do theology as the rule of faith and practice. And so when I'm doing theology, I take a, a canonical approach. By that, I mean that scripture is canonical in the sense of being the supreme rule or standard in that initial sense of the term canon as, as a rule, and that the canon is a unified but not uniform corpus, and it's canonical because it is divinely commissioned. So when I'm trying to ground theological conclusions in scripture, I'm looking for biblical warrant that the conclusion that I'm reaching actually has some grounding within scripture or what is a necessary inference from what scripture actually teaches, and that it's consistent with what with all of what scripture affirms. And so that's what I refer to in the book as the standard of biblical warrant. And adjacent to that is, is the standard of systematic coherence. Uh, I don't believe the Bible contradicts itself. So if there's an actual contradiction in our system, then something has gone wrong in the way that I'm, that I'm interpreting scripture, the way I am approaching it. And so both the standard of biblical warrant and systematic coherence, those are the two standards that I operate with when it comes to the doctrine of God and the rest of theology. Hmm. That's super cool. And one thing I'm interested in is like looking at like, so what is your view then like on the nature of like tradition? So like some people will say like, especially like going into debates over like classical theism, like, well, all the church fathers, like they're going to support this classical theism. Um, so then we have to also consider that when we're like looking at scripture. So I'd be curious, like, what are your thoughts on that question, John? Something just kind of came to my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A couple of things there. So first of all, I, I take the, the, what I consider to be, uh, the mainstream Protestant view that tradition is ancillary, takes a servant role in relationship to scripture. So scripture should be the norm that's not normed by anything else. And if that's actually true, then even tradition, no matter how high a view of tradition one has, tradition itself must at least in principle be ruled by the rule that is scripture. So in principle, any tradition could be wrong. And if it's true, uh, I affirm it insofar as it agrees with scripture. And many Protestant reformers affirm even, even basic fundamental creeds in that way, that they don't believe something because, because the creed says it, they believe the creed because they believe it's actually uh, a correct understanding of what scripture teaches. Now, there is, I think, uh, sometimes some confusion when we talk about classical theism and tradition. Uh, it, is, it is probably true uh, that the dominant stream within the tradition is some form of classical theism. But there's more than one kind of classical theism that can be represented. There's what I refer to in the book as strict classical theism. And that view uh, affirms a, a kind of view of God as timeless, strictly immutable, strictly impassable, and simple in a kind of strict Thomistic way. But there are others who identify themselves as classical theists who take uh, what is sometimes called a modified classical theism or a moderate classical theism, or some scholars refer to as neoclassical theism where they affirm many of the core attributes of God that are affirmed within the tradition, but they depart from views like divine timelessness, uh, strict views of immutability, simplicity, impassibility, uh, but they still want to call themselves classical theists in, in the kind of core sense of God as being the creator who is utterly distinct from his creation, 
God is all powerful, all knowing, uh, omnipresent, these kinds of core fundamental attributes of theism. And then there's some questions within the tradition as to whether there is a kind of monolithic view of the doctrine of God. So there's, there's diversity within the tradition on a number of the issues of divine attributes. And even though you can find what might appear to be kind of a dominant stream, there's also other voices in the tradition that might go in different directions. And then also different interpretations of the tradition amongst Christian scholars. And so the question is, for somebody who wants to say, okay, we need to follow this doctrine of God because this is the traditional view. Well, are we sure that the tradition is monolithic on this particular claim, number one? Mm -hmm. And number two, uh, whose interpretation of that tradition are we adopting when it comes to those particular claims? And then thirdly, there are very prominent voices within the Christian tradition themselves that affirm the unique normativity of scripture, that scripture is uniquely normative in a way the tradition is not. So Gregory of Nyssa says this explicitly. I quote this in the book. Uh, Augustine something, uh, Augustine says something very similar, uh, that scripture alone should be functioning as this kind of canonical rule. And so if somebody appeals to the tradition, I'm going to say, okay, but the tradition itself is pointing us towards scripture. And so mm -hmm. we need to go beyond the tradition, I think, back to, to scripture. That doesn't mean we should ignore the tradition. Uh, I think we can uh, be very much helped by considering the way that the tradition has approached different questions and how they've interpreted scripture. But scripture itself, if it's going to actually be the rule, needs to be allowed to function in a way that can actually question and where appropriate, even reform traditional claims that we find in the Christian tradition. Sorry for that mm -hmm. long answer, but there's a lot there to unpack. <laughs> no, yeah, I appreciate that. And because tradition, like it's a super important question, especially like when laying down like the groundwork with regards to like the doctrine of God and whatnot. So I think what would be good now is get into some of these like big debates that we're going to be talking about and like your views on like what scripture says and led to these things. So the first one we want to talk about is divine impassibility, um, important tenet of classical theism. So can you just, John, define like what divine impassibility is and like how you're going to think about it in light of scripture? Yeah, so divine impassibility can be defined in more than one way, but the, the definition of divine impassibility I'll give right now is what I call strict impassibility. So the, the simplest way to think of it is the view that God is impassable affirms that God cannot be affected by anything outside of himself. This is closely related to the view that God cannot have any passions. The way some people interpret it, impassibility just means God cannot have passions, but there's some question about what it means to have passions or not have passions, what passions mean. So impassable is, uh, the word itself is denying that God has passions, but typically it's an even deeper claim than that, that God ha cannot be affected by creation in any way whatsoever. So if God is impassable, not only can he not have emotions that are, that are responsive to anything outside of himself, he can't be affected by anything whatsoever outside of himself. So that's the strict view of impassibility. There are some advocates of divine impassibility that take a different view of impassibility that some might call qualified impassibility. So here I'm thinking of uh, theologians like Rob Lister, Daniel Castello, uh, Paul Gavriluk. Uh, in his book on the suffering of the impassable God, Gavriluk actually makes a case, and here's where there's some nuance in the tradition, or at least how the mm -hmm. tradition is interpreted. Gavriluk actually makes the case that in the Christian tradition, in the patristic tradition, when a Christian fathers were using the word impassable or apatheia, the Greek term there, to deny pathos of God, uh, they were not meaning to deny that God has emotions like in the psychological sense, he claims. They were actually using that as what he calls an apophatic qualifier. That is mm -hmm. to deny some things about God that would make him more creaturely. So God does not have emotions the way creatures have emotions. Uh, God is creator, not a creature, but not to deny emotions altogether and not to affirm something like strict or strong impassibility. In fact, he argues that in the Christian tradition, there's something like qualified impassibility and even some voices that would fall under a view that I would call qualified passability. And qualified passability is my own view that I take. Uh, I'll mention why it's qualified in a moment. Uh, but qualified passability just means that God is voluntarily passable in relation to the world in a way that does not collapse or diminish the creator-creature distinction, okay? Mm -hmm. So he's voluntarily passable in relation to the world. That means he freely created the world. The world is not essential to God's being, 
and he freely chooses to engage in a relationship with creation in such a way that it actually makes a difference to God's own life. So both of those are free decisions of God. That's qualified passability. Uh, another passibilist view that I think uh, is, is incorrect because it denies, in my view, the creator-creature distinction is what I call essential passability. And essential passability or unqualified passability is the view that God is passable in relation to the world in a way that's essential to God's nature. Mm -hmm. The problem with that claim, in my view, or one of the problems I should say, is that that requires for God to be who he is, for there to be some world, some creation in which God is in relation to. And mm -hmm. that means that the world is necessary to God's being, which I think denies not only creation ex nihilo, but the creator creature distinction and amounts to some form of something like uh, panentheism, which I think there are good reasons to deny biblically and otherwise. So I, I land uh, in the position that I call qualified passability. Uh, God would not be affected by anything if he did not choose to create anything and then choose to allow himself to be open to be affected by creation. But God has chosen to do those things and he opens himself up to being affected by the world. And this, I think, is very robustly depicted throughout scripture in the biblical depictions of the way God relates to creatures, not only with respect to divine love, but a whole host of other uh, divine attributes and relationships that God is depicted as having throughout scripture with creatures. Mm, that's super good. So like your view then, John, just to summarize here, is we have a God who voluntarily chooses to be in like some sense uh, passable and able to like experience like emotions and, and stuff like that. It's not something that essential to God where he has to, but it's something that he chooses because maybe he loves us or wants to like experience the world with us in, in a sense. Is that kind of what you're trying to get at? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. It, I mean, of course, there is something essential to God that he has the capacity to have relationship. And I think that's mm -hmm. already built into the Trinity. But the relationship with the world itself is a voluntary decision in addition to what is essential to God's nature. So there's love in God's nature, as I understand it. And we'll talk about the Trinity more later. Uh, but mm -hmm. there's love in God's nature, even apart from the world, in the inter-Trinitarian relations of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then God goes beyond that, even though he doesn't need to. He needs nothing to create the world. And to enter into love relationship with the world in a way that actually affects him. And I'm just using the world as the shorthand for all creation. When I say world, I don't mean this planet. I mean all of creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's super cool. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to time. There's a lot of like really big topics we're going to tackle. So we're going to go one after the other here. Um, but let's talk about like God's relationship to time, John. So in the book, like how do you view the idea of like understanding God's relationship to time? And there's the idea of, like, is God timeless? Is he temporal? Um, so what's going on here? Yeah. So, so the question of God's time, God's relationship to time is actually, in my view, bound up with the bouquet of these other attributes, including passability, including the question of immutability, right? So the view, one view uh, that strict classical theists hold is that God is timeless, by which they mean there is no succession in God's life. So there's no before or after for God. There's no temporal succession uh, for God. That's the timeless view. And one way of thinking of that is that God is incompatible with time, where time is defined as succession. I, uh, I favor the view that God is temporal, uh, which must not be confused with viewing God as temporary. God is eternal. Everyone in the discussion agrees with that, meaning God has no beginning and has no end. But those who affirm divine temporality affirm that God is everlastingly eternal, as opposed to timelessly eternal. And that means that God does experience some succession uh, in his life. There is time that is real to God's life. However, this needs to be qualified because scripture is very clear, uh, again, about the creator-creature distinction. And so when we say that God is temporal, we should not make the mistake of thinking that God is temporal in precisely the way that creatures are temporal. And so because of this, I affirm what some call analogical temporality. And this just means minimally that God can experience succession in his life in some way that's appropriate to divinity, which is not the same as, as it is for creatures who are limited and time-bound in ways that God is not. Now, the reason why I think this is the case is because I think that in order to affirm the kinds of things that God is said to have done and the kinds of relationships that scripture depicts God as having, in order to affirm that that is true, I think we're going to have to end up with viewing God as not timeless, but temporal in some fashion. And so throughout scripture, God is depicted as 
reacting to creatures, having emotional reactions that are responsive to creatures in time from changing from, uh, from changing from one emotional state to another, which requires time. Right. And so mm-hmm. let me take a step back and kind of, kind of put that on the table. I won't try to rattle off all the biblical texts. Pretty much everyone in the discussion agrees that scripture depicts God as passable. The question is whether we should take those depictions as actually true about God. And we can talk about that more uh, later on, why one would take them as true or not. I take them to be true depictions of God, although analogical, true depictions of the way God actually uh, interacts with the world. But bound up with timelessness is the question of whether God can change. If God can change in any way whatsoever, then God cannot be timeless because changes, at least real changes, require time. So in order order for there to be a real change, there needs to be a time one in which something is in one state and a time two in which that something is in another state. So if God Mm -hmm. undergoes any change, that means he must experience some passing of time in his life. Scripture, I believe, very robustly depicts God as experiencing relational changes. And and if that's true that God experiences relational changes, well, those kinds of changes take time. And therefore, I think the, the best conclusion to arrive at is that God is not timeless, but is temporal in some analogical analogical fashion. There's much more to say about that, but that's the basic idea uh, of God's relationship to time. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. And I like how you think about this idea of like, we're looking at like God changing first. And like, if there's some sense in which God changes, well, then like this idea of like timelessness, like it's going to be hard to affirm that because um, you're going to need some sort of time to go through. So yeah, I think that's a really great way of thinking about this. Um, so one thing that was really interesting reading your book is thinking about like the problem of evil. Uh, obviously, like a lot of people have written on it and talked about it. So how do you approach the problem of di- divine evil? And one thing you bring up in your book a lot is you spend a, a, a big section talking about like uh, evil spiritual beings and how that may play a role in the problem of evil. So what are your thoughts here, John? Yeah, so so the approach to evil that, that I favor and I try to make a case for in this book and in other work of mine is a cosmic conflict, the odyssey of love. And so this particular approach to the problem of evil is not denying that any other any of the other approaches are helpful, but is trying to push further and say that there is a particular motif that's dominant throughout scripture, or prominent, I should say, without scripture, that uh, sheds a lot of light, I believe, on the problem of evil. And that is the motif uh, that many scholars identify as the cosmic conflict. And so the idea of a cosmic conflict can, can minimally just be just be affirmed the way that the words that Jesus uses in his parable of the wheat and the tares, where you have this parable that Jesus tells about a landowner who sows good seed in his field, but then overnight uh, an enemy comes in and sows tares, which are like noxious weeds among the the seeds in his field. And over time, of course, uh, the, the wheat springs up, but then also these weeds or tares spring up as well. And you have this question that is asked there. This is, this is in Matthew 13. You have this question that the landowner servants ask him, right? If you, if you only sowed good seeds in your field, why is there, are there tares in your field, right? And this is analogous to the question people ask, if God only created a good world or God only created good, why is there evil in this world? And here, uh, the answer that Jesus gives in the mouth of, of the landowner to his servants is this. He says, an enemy has done this. And if you keep reading the parable, you find later that Jesus, you don't have to guess, Jesus just identifies the enemy as the devil himself. And I don't build the cosmic coffee just on that parable, but that's a very quick and easy place to see this conflict depicted in the parable. But all throughout scripture, especially in the New Testament, there is this uh, concept that God's kingdom is being opposed in some significant sense by the devil and his minions, demonic agencies. So three points that I would put on the table that would uh, define what what a cosmic conflict is. Uh, First, there is a cosmic conflict between the kingdom of God and the devil and his minions. And the devil and his minions are fallen creatures who rebelled against God's government. Number two, and this is crucial to recognize, this conflict is not a conflict of sheer power. A conflict of sheer power would be impossible given the fact that God is all-powerful or omnipotent. That means this must be a conflict of another kind. Well, what kind is it? I try to make a case that this conflict is a conflict over character that includes allegations against God's judgment and government. But if it's actually a conflict over God's character, it can't be settled simply by a show of force. It requires some kind of demonstration. And this is what is happening in the history of redemption at the cross and beyond. And thirdly, this cosmic conflict involves the idea that the devil is in some sense 
the temporary and limited ruler of this world. Jesus himself, mm -hmm. three times in the book of John, calls the devil the ruler of this world, which only makes sense if the devil possesses some real power and authority, some limited and temporary rulership in this world. The good news is it's limited and it's quickly approaching its end. In the book of Revelation, it says the devil knows that his time is short, but there appears to be some limited jurisdiction that has been afforded to the devil in which he can oppose the kingdom of God. And this plays out throughout the story of scripture. So that's the cosmic conflict view in a nutshell. Yeah, that's super cool. And I love everything about this because this is something I've been thinking about a lot, a lot more recently. It's just like this idea of like, when you look at like the problem of evil, there's this question of like, well, why would God allow certain evils? It's like in part, and it's like, well, there are potentially like these other like evil beings in the world, which may be some sort of explanation for them. So I'd be curious, like, are you familiar with like Michael Heiser's work on like the unseen realm and like spiritual beings? And like, would you agree with something similar to like what Heiser argues? Yeah, I agree. I, there's some nuances that Heiser and I would take different views on, but I agree overall mm -hmm. with what he's getting at in his work. I think he's put on the table a very robust conception of the unseen realm that is very, very specifically depicted throughout scripture. Uh, mm -hmm. But I try to take that cosmic conflict motif and apply it specifically to this problem of evil. And one mm -hmm. might wonder at this juncture, well, exactly how does it help to resolve the problem of evil? Yeah. Doesn't it just push the problem back a step, right? This is the kinds of objections that, that I might anticipate. Uh, but the first thing that I would want to say when applying it specifically to the problem of evil is that there are many things we do not know, right? And so there's a lot of questions that we don't have answers to. So we should be humble when we approach the problem of evil. We should recognize we're, we're not going to know the answers to everything. Uh, but there are some things that I think are revealed in Scripture. First of all, I think there's a very robust uh, evidence throughout Scripture that God does not always get what he wants. And mm -hmm. God does not always get what he wants because he grants creatures freedom to do otherwise than he wills. And if you expand that to the idea that he also grants freedom, not only to human creatures, but also to other intelligent creatures uh, that are identified in scripture as demons, then you have creatures that are working against God's will in the universe, both humans and also celestial creatures. So God grants and commits himself to respecting free will, even when creatures do evil, I believe, because I believe that that kind of free will is a necessary pre prerequisite to love and God himself is love. Now that by itself, if you only stop there, is just kind of what's, what's known as a free will defense. And I think the free will defense is very helpful, but I think there's also more to the story. But because mm -hmm. there are kinds of evils in the world that we see and experience that it seems like God could prevent without impinging on anyone's free will specifically. And so mm -hmm. for that, I think there is more to the story. And that's where the cosmic conflict comes in. I think there are many things going on in the background behind the scenes that we just don't see and we're just not privy to seeing. But we see hints and even stronger than hints of them throughout the biblical story of redemption. In fact, you could argue that this the story of the cosmic conflict is just essential to the story of the Gospels. I mean, you can't go very far in the book of Matthew without finding this encounter. And it's actually part and parcel of Christ's mission. Uh, he, he says that he, uh, the New Testament, I should say, says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. And so this is part of what he is doing. Now, in this cosmic conflict, I believe there's reason to believe, according to scripture, that there are some parameters that are set in the heavenly court or the heavenly council. Uh, this heavenly council appears in the book of Job. It appears other places in the Old Testament uh, and also in the New Testament. And so there are some parameters that are set in the heavenly council within which the enemy has some jurisdiction to try to prove his allegations against God and against God's government. And for lack of a better term, I refer to those parameters as rules of engagement. And these rules of engagement are not unilaterally set by God, but God agrees to them before the heavenly council. Uh, and because God agrees to them, he's morally bound to those rules uh, within the cosmic conflict. If this is true, it follows from this uh, that God always does everything he can, given the alternatives to bring about the best good for all of us. But sometimes there are evils that occur in this world that for God to prevent would either undermine free will that he's committed himself to for the sake of love or go against those rules of engagement that God has morally committed himself to. Or if God were to prevent that, it would actually be worse on the whole in ways we don't fully understand. So there's a number of avenues that might be the case there. But I think this allows us to affirm that God knows everything, that God is entirely good, always wants what is good, and God is all powerful. 
And yet in some cases, there are things that God morally cannot prevent, even though he wants to prevent them. And yet at the same time, because these are temporary rules, this is a temporary conflict, in the end, God will finally eradicate evil forevermore. In the meantime, we can look not only to this understanding of the cosmic conflict, but if somebody's wrestling with the problem of evil, I would strongly encourage them to look to the cross. Because I believe there you see God who becomes human in Christ and in Christ mm -hmm. suffers for us. And I think when we look to the God of the cross, the suffering God of the cross, we can be assured, even if we don't understand everything that's happening around us and why God would allow the things he allows, we can be assured that the God of the cross, Jesus, can be trusted even if, uh, even if we don't have all the answers we'd like to have. Mm -hmm. That's super good. Now, I just thought about well, thinking of the God of the cross. I just started reading Athanasius of Alexandria's like on the incarnation. And like he talks about this idea of like the like God, like literally just like coming and taking the flesh in the person of Jesus, like like a very basic conception of the incarnation. But it's like like I just like it hit me again. I was like, wow, this is actually pretty amazing and pretty beautiful mm -hmm. and um, all kinds of things. So I'm glad you brought that up. So Absolutely. one question that I had for you that isn't really addressed in the book so much, but something I wonder about is. Could they potentially this um this this theodicy be extended to the question of like animal suffering? Like to me, like there's this big question of if we have say we take like the idea that the earth isn't like a young earth, um we have these like millions of years of animal suffering and things like this, and we wonder like could this like cosmic co conflict theodicy be extended? Do you think to animal suffering? Yes, I think it could. I don't think I don't think there's biblical warrant for this per se to extend in that direction, and that's not my own preferred view. But there are mm -hmm. some who try to resolve the the problem of animal animal suffering over long ages. For those who take uh, a macroevolutionary view of long ages with suffering before the fall, long before there's any humans in the picture, and some of them do appeal to something, some kind of a cosmic fall hypothesis, uh, some fall that took place before the the fall of Adam and Eve on Earth that that precipitated all of this animal suffering and might uh, provide some justification or some sufficient reason why there is all that animal suffering before death and before sin. That's not my particular view, uh, but, but I do think that animal suffering is a big problem uh, for the Odyssey. And I do think that a cosmic conflict view can help in that respect. Mm. Yeah, super cool. So let's talk about um, the Trinity. I do want to say if you're enjoying this, we're going to be doing a little bit of Q&A in about 15 minutes. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or send them in the super chat. Uh, but let's look at the question of the Trinity. So how do we make sense of the Trinity? A lot of people get, <laughs> maybe you just be like, how do we even like start explaining this? Um, and like, what's your kind of preferred model of understanding the Trinity, John? Yeah, so I like to, in discussing this, I like to distinguish between what I call the core Trinity doctrine and then other questions that might be asked about the Trinity doctrine, like questions about eternal relations within the Trinity, uh, whether there's subordination within the Trinity, all those kinds of issues that even Trinitarians sometimes take different views on. I, want, I try to disentangle that from what I call the core Trinity doctrine uh, for two reasons. Number one, I think the, the, there's very strong biblical evidence for the core Trinity doctrine. And unfortunately, uh, oftentimes when you hear, you hear people say things like the Trinity doctrine is not taught in Scripture. And even some people who affirm the Trinity doctrine sometimes say that. But when they say that, they typically mean something like uh, this full-blown Trinity doctrine that we find, say, in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed is not found mm -hmm. explicitly in Scripture. That's what they typically mean when they say the Trinity doctrine is not there. And that's true as far as it goes, uh, although some would try to make a biblical case even for those creedal formulations. Uh, but but, but it, it's not true that the Trinity doctrine is not warranted in scripture, if by that we mean what I call the core Trinity doctrine. I make a case in the book that there is abundant biblical warrant for this basic or core Trinity doctrine. And this is what the core Trinity doctrine is in just one sentence. There is one and only one God in three distinct, fully divine persons. OK, now I, mm -hmm. I put fully there in parentheses. I know you can't see that when I'm talking, yeah. but I say fully only to to forestall anyone making the claim that the son or the spirit is partially divine. Uh, I'm convinced that there's biblical evidence, biblical reasons to deny any gradation of divinity there. You cannot be uh, a little bit uh, divine any more than you can be a little bit pregnant. Right. So you're either God or not. This is what is affirmed when 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 God is uh, speaking to Isaiah uh, in Isaiah 40 through 48, he differentiates himself from the false gods of the nations in many ways. One of those ways is by saying, there is no one like me. I am God and there is no one else. And there's no one that's even like me, right? And so mm -hmm. there's no gradation of divinity. 
that you're either worthy of worship or you're not. And if you're worthy of worship, then you are God in the biblical sense. And there's, there's not gradations of divinity. So there's one and only one God in three distinct divine persons. That's the core Trinity doctrine. Now that core Trinity doctrine can be parsed out into three or four claims. You can make it even simpler than the four claims that I often put forth. Uh, but for sake of clarity, four claims. First of all, there is one and only one God. And there is just abundant biblical evidence that the Bible affirms a very strong form of monotheism. There is only one God. There is no one else. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Mark 12, 29. It's all over the Old and the New Testament. So that claim is very strongly biblically warranted. The second claim is that there are three persons that we refer to as a Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. And there's all kinds of Trinitarian formulas. And one might say, well, those, those texts like in like in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, to baptize in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and many other instances where the Father, Son, and Spirit are mentioned together. They don't teach the full Trinity doctrine by themselves, but of course they identify these three persons of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And that brings us to the third point. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons. First, there is abundant biblical testimony, and I try to lay this out in the book, just what that testimony is, that all three are persons, meaning the way I mean it is they have attributes that only persons have, which include things like self-consciousness, the faculty of reason, and the ability to will or make voluntary decisions. And this is true also of the Holy Spirit. There's all kinds of texts affirming that the Spirit uh, wills things, the Spirit can be grieved, etc. that affirms the full personhood of those persons. And scripture affirms that all three persons are divine. Now, if you add up all those claims together, if all those claims are biblically warranted, there's only one God, uh, the, there's three, the three persons of the Father, Son, and the Spirit are distinct persons, and they're all divine, those claims add up to the core Trinity doctrine. There's only one God, mm -hmm. but that God is the three persons of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. As far as I can see, that's the only way to affirm all of those biblically warranted claims together in that minimal or core doctrine of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. That's super cool. So one of the things you talk about, like going further in the book is saying that to argue that these three persons are in some sense, like distinct um, from each other, which is like a more like, so it's a very interesting model of the Trinity. Um, it's a common one, like a so, like almost like a social Trinitarian model, you, you could say. Um, hopefully you can clarify if I'm wrong there. But like, then the question is like, if we think about these like three persons, it's like to some level, like as distinct from one another. How do we, can we make sense still of like believing in like one God? Because a lot of people would say like, that sounds a little bit, John, like tritheism. Yeah, this is a common complaint that people have against social or relational conceptions of the Trinity. Uh, first of all, I want to say that there are some concept, there are some social conceptions of the Trinity that I think are are incorrect and are too weak. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that a simple family analogy is enough. I do think that there is a kind of robust oneness of God in a very strong ontological sense. Uh, and one way that those who affirm either social conception of the Trinity or relational conception of the Trinity, one way they affirm oneness is to say that the three persons uh, are one God in some way that does not amount to there being three gods. And so sometimes uh, you'll find people say there is some kind of monotheizing factor or some particular relation between the three persons that amounts to them being one God or one being rather than three. And so many Trinitarians who take this view will, will appeal to something called perichoresis or coherence, coherence, that in some sense, the Father is in the Son and the Spirit, and the Son is in the Father and the Spirit, and the Spirit is in the Father and the Son, that they cohere in some way that renders them one God and not three. Uh, but I don't think we need to know or make a dogmatic claim about the mechanism of the oneness in order to affirm that God is oneness. It, it shouldn't surprise us that the being of God transcends any kind of creaturely analogy and maybe even creaturely understanding. As long as there's not a contradiction, an actual contradiction involved, I don't need to, need to know the mechanism of exactly how God is one, but just need to be able to affirm without contradiction that God is ontologically one in some robust mm -hmm. sense, even if that sense transcends our limited understanding uh, in this case. So two things that I would want to add there at least. One of the things that trips people up when they think of the Trinity doctrine is they think of the idea of there being three persons and one God. When they hear the word persons, they think of persons in the sense of like human persons, mm -hmm. like physically individuated persons, right? Yeah. But the persons of the Trinity outside of the incarnation, of course, when it comes to Jesus, 
are not persons in the sense of physically individuated persons, uh, mm -hmm. even though the son took on physical form. So God is not incompatible with physical form. Jesus himself taught to the, the woman at the well in Samaria that God is spirit. And there's all kinds of teachings in scripture that God is not physically restricted to particular locations. He's not restricted to physical form. And so God is not a person in the sense of a physically individuated person. God is also omnipresent, meaning in some strong sense, God is everywhere. God's presence is everywhere. And so if you have those things, there's not a physical individuation of them, then the three persons can be one and united all the time in ways we don't fully understand, analogous to the way we don't fully understand how anything or anyone could be omnipresent. And yet we affirm that God is omnipresent. So by removing that idea of persons as being physical persons, or like you and I are persons, you're there and I'm here. And obviously we can't be one being because you're there and I'm here. God mm -hmm. is not restricted in that way ontologically being omnipresent and having other core attributes of divinity. The other thing we need to distinguish is when we say that God is one God and three persons, we're not saying a contradiction that, that amounts to there being three gods. First of all, when we say the son is God, the father is God, the spirit is God, we mean that not in the sense of the is of identity, that is to say the, the word the son does not mean everything in that sentence that the word God means. The son is God, but God is more than the son because God is father, son, and Holy Spirit, right? So the is of identity would say the word son means everything the word God means, and the word God means everything the word son means. And that, that's not true, right? Similar to the way uh, that if I say uh, Dr. Peckham is John, and I'm referring to myself in both cases, in that case, the word John refers to the same identical thing as the words Dr. Peckham. Uh, that's kind of the is of identity. The is of identity with regard to the Trinity would be the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are God, right? That's the is mm -hmm. of identity, or God is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But that's different from the is of predication. The is of predication is when you say there's something true about something, right? So like the shirt is blue, you're not saying that blue is identical to the shirt, or that everything that's true about the shirt is that it's blue. No, you're just predicating something that's true about the shirt. And this is what we mean when we say the father is God or the son is God. The son is God as a predicate. It's true of the son that he is God, but he's not God by himself. He's God always in a central love relationship with the father and the spirit. And that is true of the father and it's true of the spirit. So if it is true that the son and the father and the spirit are united in some way that makes them one and only one God, this does not amount to having three gods, even though you have three persons. Right? And you can affirm that something is one in some sense and three in another sense without any contradiction. Right, And so mm -hmm. you could have, now, I don't think there's any analogy of the Trinity that actually is a good analogy. And I'm not using this as an analogy because I don't think there's anything in creation that is three and one in the way that God is three and one. But I, I mentioned this uh, object lesson just to spark intuitions so people can recognize that you already know that there are things that can be three in one way and one in another way, right? And so if you mm -hmm. think of a three-leaf clover, and again, I don't mean that God is like a three-leaf clover. I don't mean that at all. But a, a three-leaf clover is, is one clover, right? But it has three leaves. So it's one in one respect, right? You could say with respect to cloverhood, but it's three in another respect with respect to having three leaves. So mm -hmm. you can see just from that simple example that to say something is three and one in different respects is not a contradiction. And so when we say that God is three, we mean God is three with respect to personhood. Now, Trinitarians mean different things when they say, when they affirm personhood. But minimally, everyone agrees God is three with regard to personhood, but he is one with regard to godhood, so to speak, or with regard to the being of God. And this is what is affirmed uh, as consubstantiality or homoousia in the, in the Nicene Creed and elsewhere, that there is one nature of God that is shared, one being that is shared by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in ways we don't fully understand, but there's one and only one God, but God is those three persons of Father, Son, and Spirit. Mm. There's so much good stuff there, John, and I love the clover um, way of thinking. I think it's because obviously you're not offering it as an analogy, but it's just yeah. like, well, like there is this idea of like, well, three and one and one and three, it's like, it's not this like direct contradiction. Like there is some way to make sense of this, even if we don't have like a perfect analogy um, for us with Trinitarianism. But the last question I have for you before we get into a little bit of Q&A, so feel free to put your questions in, is how does covenantal theism put all the pieces together? Like obviously we talked about a lot of different things here, like time and can God change and things like this in the problem of evil. But like how does covenantal theism put all these pieces together as we wrap up here? 
Yeah, good. Yeah. So the label that I give to the model of God that I try to make a case for in, in the book, Divine Attributes, is covenantal theism, as you just mentioned. And I give it this label, for lack of a better term. It falls within the broad camp of views that are neither uh, agreeing with strict classical theism, because it departs from timelessness, strict immutability, and strict impassibility, and strict simplicity. But it's also very distinct from theologies that are sometimes just called relational theologies that are often shorthand for forms of panentheism and, and, and process theology. And so covenantal theism falls within this middle camp that some call neoclassical theism, or I refer to in the book as moderate classical theism, that wants to affirm the creator-creature distinction that God is a self-existent creator of the world, not to be confused with the creation, and at the same time has a real relationship with the world. And so covenantal theism affirms a number of attributes, uh, including that God is ase. Uh, divine aseity means God is self-existent. He exists of himself. He doesn't need anything else to exist or to be who he is essentially. That's closely related to self-sufficiency, that again, he doesn't need the world in order for any of his essential attributes to be true of him. Uh, that relates to the, the, the attribute of, of qualified immutability, right? And so it's qualified because there are ways in which God changes relationally, but there are very core ways in which God does not change and cannot change. That is with respect to God's essential attributes. So to say God is immutable in a qualified sense, is to say that he changes relationally, but his essential attributes never change. So God is not growing, he's not becoming greater, he's not becoming better, et cetera. But he can mm -hmm. have real back and forth relationship with creation. And by the way, that's the, the reason I chose the word covenantal as the label for covenantal theism. I mean covenantal just in the minimal sense of back and forth relationship between more than one party. And I believe that the God of the Bible is nothing if not covenantal in this sense. Because throughout scripture, God is depicted as engaging in real back and forth relationship, acting in the world, intervening, speaking, communing, and making actual formal covenants with people. And so he's he's immutable in a qualified sense. He's passable in a qualified sense. We've already talked about what that, what that means, uh, at least in brief. I believe he's eternal in the sense of everlasting eternity. And then also those attributes like being omnipresent, omniscient, knowing all things, omnipotent, uh, and omnibenevolent. And then finally, last but not least, that God is triune, but in an essential love relationship within the Trinity that I call the Trinity of love. So covenantal mm -hmm. theism affirms all of those attributes, some of them in qualified ways, aseity, self-sufficiency, immutability, qualified passability, everlasting eternity, omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence, omnibenevolence, and relational triunity. Mm -hmm. now, obviously, there's a lot there to unpack, but that's the, the basic idea in a nutshell. And I try to make a case in the book that each of those attributes is arises from minimal affirmations in the in the biblical data. Now, of course, mm -hmm. people reading the book can can say, oh, I have a different interpretation of that biblical data. But the question will be, whatever your model of God is for me, if you're going to follow the standard of biblical warrant, has to at least be able to account for what this biblical data actually affirms or teaches. Right. And so if I misinterpret it, of course, you can say, well, you think I misinterpreted the data, but somehow you need to be able to account for this data that depicts God in this way. And I don't mm -hmm. think that some of the common moves that are made uh, by those who hold strict classical theism actually hold up under scrutiny when it comes to this biblical data. Because I think, sadly, even though I don't think this is the intention of people taking this view, I think it tends to evacuate the biblical texts in those respects of any meaning, right? And so when yeah. you say, oh, they're just metaphorical or they're just accommodative imagery, I agree they're accommodative. I agree they include metaphorical imagery, but even accommodative language and metaphorical imagery conveys something. And so I was in a panel discussion uh, some time ago and I asked the interlocutor who was taking the other view, I said, okay, I, I grant you this is analogical language, it's accommodative, there's clearly metaphors there, but my question to you is what do these texts mean after you account for that analogy and metaphor? What do they actually mm -hmm. put forth? And I'm afraid that uh, sometimes that move to say, well, it's just accommodative language is, a, is used to dismiss the language instead of actually saying, well, what does this actually mean? And there's all kinds of depictions of God in relation to the world that even after you account for them being accommodative, and even when you account for figurative, non-literal language, they still convey something. And it's very difficult to make sense of some of this data uh, as conveying anything true about God if God isn't in, involved in real relationship with the world. Mm. Well, I'd encourage people to check out this book. There's so much good stuff here. And like I was thinking about as I was driving, rushing home um, to do this, like I, I just love this book and I'd love to 
yeah, and I just encourage people to check it out. It's linked down below. So what we're going to do here is transition to a little bit of Q&A. So we have about 12 minutes of Q&A that we'll do here in a second. Um, I just want to say, as I like to pause here, just say thank you so much to everyone who supports the channel and to our new members of the channel, Martin Wheat, Josh Carnes, and Israel of Wisdom Media. I uh, really appreciate everyone's support that helps to keep the channel going. So you can join and become a member, one ninety nine a month, or a patron for as little as a dollar a month. So your support means a lot. But let's get into a little bit of Q&A. There's some really good questions here. Um, from Nick, the New Testament theologian, he says, Qualified passibility makes great sense of Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Um, how do you read that Christ hymn, Dr. Peckham? Yeah, yes, I think it does. I think actually qualified passibility is is very helpful with respect, respect to the doctrine of the incarnation altogether. I think we're going to affirm that a single subject Christology, that the son is eternal, right? Existed before becoming human, but then actually becomes human and lowers himself in some real sense. That's going to involve some kind of change in the person of the son, right? For that to be a real incarnation. And I take Philippians 2, 5 through 11 to be just one of the places where this is depicted very robustly, that Christ voluntarily lowers himself to become a human and suffer even to the to the point of death in human flesh uh, for the sake of humanity. I read that as, as actually conveying a change with regard to the son that the son willingly takes on. That does not amount to him divesting himself divinity. He empties himself of not of core, any core attributes of divinity. He remains fully divine in his sonship, but he lowers himself in a way that takes on humanity such that he can be affected by things he otherwise wouldn't be affected by through his humanity. And he does all of this for the sake of humanity as a whole. And I think this is actually essential to the entire teachings of scripture, essential to the gospel, that Christ suffers in some real sense that isn't just a suffering in humanity that Christ takes on, but actually makes a difference to God. Because I struggle to understand what God is sacrificing for us in Christ if it's merely humanity that actually suffers on the cross in some sense. I don't mean that, that divinity suffers physically, but there's some other kind of suffering that I think is taking place there. Uh, but I think Philippians 2 gives us the background for a real change in the incarnation that we need to very robustly in some way affirm that the son, the eternal son, became human without thereby becoming any less than divine. And if you have that, I think you're going to amount to something like, uh, well, I should put it this way. I think that the best way to have that kind of a view that affords that accords with all of scripture is something like qualified passability. And Gavriluk, it's a more, a more minimal kind of qualified passability than what I would put forth. But he argues that this is actually uh, what, Cyril are, what Cyril is actually getting at when he says the impassable suffered. Now, I wouldn't say it that way because I think saying God is impassable is confusing, especially in the 21st century. But the way Gavriluk understands it, understands it is that God is not in any essential sense susceptible to suffering of the kind that Christ took on in his humanity. And I would agree with that. So he's impassable in the sense that he is not naturally susceptible to things like hunger or physical pain and those kinds of things that Christ experienced in his suffering. But he took those things on and actually experienced them in some way that is true now of the single subject who is God. There's much awesome. more to say about that, but that's the basic idea. Yeah, no, that's super cool. We also have another question here from Nick, great YouTube channel, the New Testament Theologians. He says, does all three members of the Trinity experience, I believe, this qualified passibility? Do they experience it differently? Um, so, yeah, what are your thoughts here, John? Yeah, this is a great question. So I think that uh, the, the, the way, <clears throat> one kind of motif that I think really exposits in Scripture this qualified passibility is just the way God is depicted as loving in relationship to the world. Now, God is not only love in relationship to the world, God is love within the Trinity. We're not given as much data. We are given data that there is love within the relationship within the Trinity. Already in John 17, uh, Jesus talks about the love with which the Father loved him before the world, the cosmos began. And so this I take to be referring to intra-Trinitarian love before and apart from any creation. And so there is some kind of love relationship within the Trinity. I want to hesitate to not speculate about what the precise nature of that relationship is, but there's some, some at least analogical relationship between that relationship and the relationship of God's love to creatures. Because in the book of John, Jesus repeatedly talks about uh, the Father loving creatures, even as he loves them, and to love one another, even as I have loved you. And so there's some kind of a circle of love relationship that seems to involve some kind of passable relationship. Now, whatever one thinks about the intertrinitarian love relationship, I do think that there is biblical warrant 
for affirming possibility of all three persons of the Trinity in relationship to creation. Uh, Jesus is kind of kind of the easiest one. If you think that when God, when Jesus, for instance, laments over Jerusalem, uh, there are some people that will say, oh, that's only Christ's humanity lamenting over Jerusalem when he, when he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you, but you were not willing. But I think actually that that is depicting not only Christ's humanity, but also his divinity. I don't think that Christ is exhibiting a human compassion for us that God doesn't have. And actually in context, there, there are many that point out that this is kind of an echo of what is being affirmed about God in Deuteronomy 32, of God as this kind of like bird-like figure that hovers over his creation, right? And mm -hmm. so I think there and elsewhere, there's very strong reason to believe that when Christ exhibits compassionate reactions to creatures, he's actually reacting not only as human, but also as divine. And those reactions are actually mirrored in the Old Testament. The, the reactions of Jesus in the New Testament mirror, I should say, the reactions of Yahweh in the Old Testament. Over and over again in the Old Testament, Yahweh has these very, very similarly depicted uh, kinds of emotional reactions of compassion and other reactions that are attributed to Yahweh. And I think those are attributable, uh, at least in some cases in the Old Testament, uh, to the Father. And in the New Testament and also the Old Testament, we have references to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit being grieved. Both the Old Testament, Isaiah 63, and the New Testament as well, Paul warns against grieving the Holy Spirit. And so it seems that the Holy Spirit can also be affected by creaturely actions. So I think there's good reason to affirm qualified passibility of all three persons of the Trinity. Now, whether they all experience passibility in the same way, I think they don't uh, in the sense that only Christ became human. So there, there's already a difference. Uh, Christ alone was the one who suffered on the cross. And so there are some differences, but I wouldn't want to claim that I know exactly what those differences are mm -hmm. In total, I know one of the differences is that only Christ became incarnate, only Christ uh, suffered uh, on the cross, et cetera, et cetera. But there are many other ways uh, that would be different as well. Mm, super good. We have one more question that we'll probably have time for. Um, and it's a question you address a little bit in the book, but what's your position, uh, John, on open theism? Yeah, so I don't, I'm not an open theist myself with regard to foreknowledge. I do believe that there are strong reasons to affirm uh, what some call exhaustive, definite foreknowledge. And I try to lay out uh, the case for that in the book. Um, <clears throat> I think that some of the critiques that open theists uh, bring forth against strict classical theism are helpful and warranted and should be, should be at least uh, dealt with in a serious manner. And open theists and I would agree on a number of the other attributes about God. But when it comes to omniscience, I have a different view uh, when it comes to foreknowledge. And I do believe that there are many texts in scripture that affirm that God does in fact know the end from the beginning. And that I believe includes everything in between and that God knows the future with certainty and yet also grants free will. Of course, that raises an another set of questions about how those two things are compatible. But I think scripture teaches both of those things. And so I affirm both of those things. Although I have respect for open theists, I also have respect for strict classical theists that take a different view. Uh, my view is, is distinct from open theism. Mm, super good. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been so much fun. I can't believe it's already been in it almost an hour. Um, do you have any kind of like last thoughts, things you didn't get to say before we wrap things up here? Yeah, there's a lot of things that I would want to say, but I think one of the things that I want to, want to affirm uh, minimally is that when I set forth this view of covenantal theism, I'm not trying to claim that it's the only possible view or that I have everything right, but I do hope that that people will read the book and will, will also We'll also try to look at the biblical depictions of what God is like, and even more robustly try to match our conceptions of God to those depictions of God in scripture, whether or not they end up with the view that I'm making a case for. I think there's a methodological case to be made that if we're going to uphold scripture as the sole standard, we need to be able to account for these different attributes of God, these different depictions of God that are depicted as true in scripture. Uh, and so I hope that those reading the book will at least, uh, at least come with an open mind where they, will, where they will entertain the possibility that the depictions of God as engaging these back and forth relationships are true of God in some real sense. And hopefully mm -hmm. I've done a good job uh, in the book of making that case. There's, there's much more to be said about all that though. Yeah. Well, I encourage everyone to check out the book. It is linked down below. It is totally worth the read. I highly recommend it. So you can check it out down below. And if you're new here, I always encourage you to subscribe, leave a like, all that fun stuff. And you're listening, just leave a review if you're listening via podcast or click the bell. Ooh, can't talk if you're on YouTube. But John, one last time, thank you so much for coming on. It's been so much fun. Really appreciate you and all your hard work and spending an hour over here on this lowly YouTube channel to talk about um, what is God like. 
Thank you, Zach. Thanks for having me and thanks for your kind words. Appreciate it. Yes. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a good one and God bless.